Hi everybody, my name is Jova and welcome to this cafe concert about Chilean protest music. Now, before anything um, happens, just grab a mug, get a nice cup of tea, coffee, hot chocolate, whatever you're into. Um, it's just gonna be really relaxed, um, chill vibes, a little bit of content warning. There might be some mentions of violence, torture, even death. If uh, any of this is distressing to you, please bear that in mind. You can bow at any time, it's completely fine. I'm a Colombian and Chilean musician, but today I really wanna talk about Chile. I wanna talk about the Chilean tradition of the protest song, protest music. Um, it's an integral part of our culture, especially our artistic culture, of our musical culture. Um, and I really wanna share this with you, especially in light of recent current events and the times, I think it's very, let's say, um, relevant. So, get nice and cozy, stay in your bed if you want, get on your couch, set your desk, make sure you're comfortable, and get ready, because we're gonna talk about Chilean protest music. Salud. So, if we're gonna talk about Chilean protest music, we have to start at the 50s. And why the 50s? Isn't Chile like a country that's almost, no, it's more than 200 years old rather. And you're absolutely right, but um, we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> and I do wanna cover as much as I possibly can of modern Chilean protest music because that's really what's relevant to modern day, isn't it? And that begins in the 1950s. Now in the 1950s and 60s, something swept the entire Latin American, well, continents, really. And it was called, it was a movement called La Nueva Canción Movement. Nueva Canción translates to new song. And I'm gonna go in a little bit more detail about this, but there were two main um, proponents of this movement, which were a man named Atahualpa Yupanqui in Argentina, and a woman named Violeta Parra in Chile. Since this is about Chilean protest music, I'm just gonna focus on Violeta. Um, if you want, you can listen to Atahualpa Yupanqui's music as well. He's really, really good. Amazing music, but let's talk about Violeta for a bit. So, Violeta was born in 1917 in the countryside in Chile. Um, it's really contested where exactly she was born, but such are the times, uh, or were the times back then. But what was really important is that Violeta was born, um, well, she had, I think, around eight siblings. Don't quote me on that. But almost all of them were artistic. They had artistic inclinations. Her brother, Nicanor, was one of Chile's most famous poets. Um, and Violeta was significantly talented. She was exceptional, uh, many people would say. She was, I believe, the first Latin American woman, if not the first Chilean woman, to have a solo exhibition at the Louvre in Paris. Um, and that was just for her visual arts. That wasn't even including her musical contributions. She is known as the mother of Latin folklore uh, because of the works that she did in the 1950s and 1960s. So let's go a bit into that. To learn a little bit about this, you need to know a little bit of background context, which is that in Chile, like in most Latin American countries at the time, um, Chilean culture was dictated by Chilean high society which always looked at European and American, let's say, culture and arts um, for guidance. It was a very elitist uh, approach to the arts, naturally. But Violeta didn't do that. Violeta completely broke and revolutionized that tendency because what she did in the 1950s was she decided to roam the poor neighborhoods and the ordinary neighborhoods of uh, Santiago, which is the capital of Chile, and the countryside, and rescued the traditional folklore uh, and folkloric music of ordinary people um, who didn't have any claim to fame, who didn't have record deals, they, didn't, they weren't um, known by name anywhere. They just sang their songs, the songs that were passed on to them and that they had themselves had written. She rescued all of that tradition, that folkloric culture that was in danger of being erased and replaced for something much more European. Um, 
and she popularized it. She went back to Santiago, she started a radio show, she distributed this music to the masses, and she eventually started to write her own music. And these works are still in the Chilean canon today. They are some of the most important songs um, that my people still listen to. I grew up on these songs. Me mandaron una carta por el correo temprano. En esa carta me dicen que cayó preso mi hermano. The song that you're listening to right now is called La Carta. It translates to the letter. It, Violeta wrote it about um, her brother who was uh, imprisoned for supporting a strike. It really goes into police brutality and the injustice that and oppression that the government would ensue on its citizens. Violeta was um, a very political person and she began this movement which exploded throughout the entirety of Latin America, um, but also as well as Chile, which is where it, was, it originated along with um, Atahualpa Yupanqui in Argentina. Um, in Chile, many different bands and musicians um, were part of this incredible movement, including uh, the bands Quila Payun, Inti Gimani, uh, even Violeta Parra's own uh, son and daughter, Angel and Isabel Parra, um, but next, I really want to talk to you about a very important person called Victor Jara. He, um, well, actually, before I go into Victor's story, I need to tell you about the events that led up to uh, the 70s. In the 1960s, um, a man named Eduardo Frei Montalva became president of Chile. He was a, a founding member of the Democratic Christian Party. It was a centrist party. Um, and while he was backed by the United States, he, did, um, he contributed to many reforms that the people desperately needed at the time, including the nationalization of copper mines. Now, the U.S.'s gambit was that with this man in power, uh, the people would be appeased and he would break um, the revolutionary movements of the time. This didn't work. People wanted more and more and more because, well, the work is never done, is it? In 1970, a man named Salvador Allende became president. Now, Salvador Allende was the leader of La Unidad Popular, which was, um, which translates to the people's unity or the popular unity. It's difficult to translate, but you get the point. Um, and it was a coalition of radical left-wing parties that sought to improve conditions for the working class. This was significant because Allende was, I, I want to say the world's, but if not Latin America's first uh, democratically elected socialist head of state. This was significant, especially during the Cold War, which as we all know, um, the United States didn't want any socialists or any, anybody even related to socialism in the region. Um, so Nixon, who was president at the time, he was recorded telling one of his aides to make the Chilean economy scream. And while there isn't, there isn't concrete proof of this, it's pretty obvious that the United States, together with the economic elite in Chile, um, colluded and boycotted Allende's government. Bread lines were formed. Um, there wasn't enough food in the supermarkets. My father would even tell me stories about this, how they had to wait in line. Um, for a single loaf of bread and it just it didn't make any sense but I'll, I'll go into it a, a, um, a little bit later what you need to know is that all of this culminated in 1973 in a coup and that coup resulted in a 17 year long fascist dictatorship under General Augusto Pinochet now I went on off on a bit of a tangent but it's related I promise Victor um, really ties into the story because Victor was um, a staunch communist. He was a militant member of the Communist Party. All of his works and his music were about uh, the working class, empowering, uh, well, the working class, uh, solidarity with leftist movements around the world, including with Vietnam and Cuba, and, you know, talking about revolutionary figures like Che Guevara. He was very much a revolutionary working class man who just so happened to be an artist. Um, and that's really how he described himself as a working 
artist rather than an artiste, as some would say. Nobody says that, but whatever. What happened in 1973, on the 11th of September 1973, which was the day that the Chilean military um, enacted this coup? So what Victor did, he, um, he heard the news. Uh, he went to the Universidad Técnica del Estado, one of the universities in Chile. Today it's called the University of Santiago de Chile. He went to that university and he occupied it with, um, other, with his students, with uh, fellow teachers and colleagues and you know, comrades, um, and just waited to see what would happen the following day. The military came, they rounded them all up, and they took them to the Estadio Nacional. Um, the Estadio Nacional was the national stadium, which was a sports arena, a sports stadium. But, and trigger warning for violence, um, so if, if this makes you uncomfortable, please bow out. Um, but they converted the stadium into a torture camp. Um, for the four days, they tortured Victor Jara. Um, it's about to get graphic, but they broke his wrists. They cut out his tongue. They made sure that he would never be able to sing or play guitar again. They beat him repeatedly, repeatedly, but Victor never faltered. Other prisoners at the time reported that they always saw him smiling despite getting beaten, despite getting tortured. And he never gave in. And finally, one of the, I think it was one of the generals, I'm not entirely sure, his rank, decided that he was going to play Russian roulette, one-sided Russian roulette with Victor, and eventually shot him in the head. The point is, Victor, Victor died for singing uh, his songs, for singing and spreading his message, and for singing what he believed in. And that is the key um, element of Chilean protest music that many people greater than us have come before us and have died singing for something greater than themselves. And that is the legacy that we need to live up to. That is who we look up to. So I'm gonna sing a song for you. It's my interpretation of a Victor Jara song. It's called Manifiesto. Manifiesto translates to manifesto. It's all about how Victor said that an artist should not commercialize or sell themselves out. And it's something that I keep close to my heart. So here goes. El canto tiene sentido 
cuando palpitan las venas de que morirá cantando las verdades verdaderas no las disojas fugaces ni las famas extranjeras sino el canto de una londra hasta el fondo de la tierra ah, ah, say um, in Chile, well, a lot of us, not everybody, but a lot of us say, um, Victor vive, which means Victor still lives, and he lives in our hearts. Sounds corny, but he does. He lives in his songs and in our songs, uh, in our voices and in our struggle. Um, and it's just about living up to the legacy that he left behind. So let's move on. Let's talk about that legacy, shall we? Let's move on to the 70s, okay? Where the, the, dicta uh, the dictatorship is in full swing, right? Um, Pinochet has consolidated power. Uh, he's being supported by the United States, amongst other um, big powers in the world. He's uh, exiling people, persecuting musicians, um, torturing people, jailing people, sending people to concentration camps, executing people. Um, even people would just disappear. And even today, um, many bodies have never been found. Nobody knows what happens to these people. And um, the families of the desaparecidos, as we call them, the disappeared, the missing people, um, have to live with this. And they still don't have justice today. And this was what it was like under the dictatorship. Persecution, fear. Uh, you didn't know if you could be ratted out by the secret police. Imagine, imagine being a musician under those circumstances. You're heavily censored. You can only sing what the dictator wants you to sing. And if you say one thing against him, that's it for you. Or you have to be on the run. Um, and that's what a lot of bands did. They, they were exiled or they left you they, before they could be persecuted and, well, tortured in the same way that Victor was. So, the musical scene really shifted in the 70s. The, the Nueva Canción movement in Chile officially broke apart um, because how could it thrive under a dictatorship? It was impossible. And, and many people were disillusioned with the messages of hope that, 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 that the artists of that movement had sung about, that had brought to the people because they were in a dictatorship. What hope is there? Or at least that's how they felt at the time. Um, there were, oh, don't get me wrong, there were still artists that kept the fight going, that kept that tradition going. And um, another movement, a smaller movement, uh, called the Cancion Nueva, uh, which is basically new song in a different order, 
um, grew in the 70s, but it never quite reached the peak of what the Nueva Canción movement had. But across Latin America during the 70s, rock started mm, gaining access to the mainstream and taking the main stage. Started is the key word. It wasn't in full swing yet. But while rock had already existed in Latin America in the 60s, it was in the 70s that different rock bands started to experiment and expand uh, their abilities and sort of expand the genre and add their own Latin American influences to them. And there's so many different bands in Argentina, Sui Generis, in Colombia, in Brazil. Um, but in Chile, we had, we had a lot as well, Los Blobs, amongst others. But I want to talk to you about Los Jaivas. <laughs> Los Jaivas were a fusion band, which is as best as I can describe them simply. Really, they mixed psychedelic and progressive rock with Andean music, which was completely unheard of at the time. If you don't know anything about Andean music or you're asking yourself, but Jova, what's Andean? It's the music that comes from the indigenous people that live in the Andes and in the vicinity. So um, the Andes, if you don't know, are a mountain region that come that go um, all the way from Colombia down the spine of Latin America to Chile and Argentina. And um, the indigenous people that kind of populate a lot of this, a, a, a huge part of this mountain range and surrounding areas are uh, the Quechua people and uh, who were descended from the Incans um, and the Aymara people. And their music is very distinctly indigenous, but it's also very popular in Peru, in Bolivia, um, somewhat in Chile and Argentina, in Ecuador, um, a, bit, a little bit in Colombia. Granted, all these countries have very different cultures, but any music exists in all of these countries, and Chile is no exception, as those Jaivas showed. Um, so they, they mixed these elements together to form this completely new style of rock um, that was completely original. Um, the song that's playing now is called Todos Juntos, Everybody Together. And you can really hear the Andean influences but with this rock vibe um, that was very characteristic of the 70s. So while Los Jaivas were never an overtly political band, they never really talked about political themes, the way that someone like Victor Jara would. Um, they did leave Chile to, in order to escape the persecution of musicians under Pinochet and other artists. Uh, they lived in Argentina, in Spain, they toured across Europe, they um, and eventually came back to Latin America and then to Chile. Um, but they always played in solidarity against, against the dictatorship and in solidarity with uh, the victims of the dictatorship and the brutality of the regime. But really what I want to talk to you about is the 80s. So the 80s were completely dominated by the dictatorship. No, um, it wasn't like the 70s, which is kind of cut in half, well not in half, but you know, in pieces. The 80s was completely dominated by, the, by Pinochet's dictatorship. But the 80s was also when rock became the main uh, counterculture, uh, musical counterculture in Latin America, all across the region, um, from the South Cone, which is Chile and Argentina and Uruguay, all the way up to Mexico. And, well, Chile obviously was no exception. And under the dictatorship, rock provided something that Nueva Canción couldn't. Uh, a decade ago and it provided a voice for a generation and a voice and an outlet for rebellion so again so many different rock bands to choose from but I really the most the most prominent band at the time uh, was called Los Prisioneros <laughs> If you ask 
any Chilean, they know the Prisioneros. And chances are that they love them. We all love the Prisioneros. Uh, at least most of us do. I grew up listening to them. Um, and their music was just so rebellious and so, had, had a very punk attitude to it. Three poor kids from the, one of the poorer neighborhoods of Santiago, uh, growing up with almost nothing, banding together to form a band and highlighted the injustices of Chilean society under the dictatorship, many of which are still current today, which is something to think about. Uh, we'll talk about that more a bit later. So, the song you're listening to now is called El Baile de los que Sobran. It's called, um, translates to the dance of those who are left over, roughly. Uh, and it really talks about the injustice, the, the, the socioeconomic injustice and inequality uh, that affects your education, uh, your living standards, and your opportunities, just anything, every part of your life and it's still relevant today. But just think how absolutely rebellious and punk it was to be singing about and criticizing Chilean culture. A Chilean culture that benefited Chilean high society, uh, the upper class which was in charge of the dictatorship, that made you a target. Fortunately, they were never caught, you know. Um, and they enjoyed widespread popularity, not just in Chile, but across um, Latin America, and I just love them. I love them so much. I just think they're they're an amazing band, and um, they're really they were the voice of my father's generation. But we still sing them to hit today. And if that's not timeless, I don't know what is. So, you know, I'm gonna sing um, another song. This one is by Los Prisioneros. It's gonna be a little bit more upbeat, a little bit less sad. Um, has a long name. It's called Latino America es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos. You don't have to even try to understand what I just said if you don't speak Spanish. It's fine. It means Latin America is a village uh, south of the United States. And it really talks about how um, Latin America is not taken seriously because it's part of the third world. It's just seen as a village. Um, this is especially true for the states, which, you know, a lot of um, anti latina racism and discrimination, but that's a topic for another time. Es un sitio exótico para visitar Es un lugar económico Pero inadecuado para habitar Les ofrecen Latinoamérica El carnaval de río y las ruinas aztecas El de sucio vagando en las calles Dispuesta a venderse por algunos USA dollars Nadie en el resto del planeta Toma en serio a este inmenso pueblo Lleno de tristeza Se sonríen cuando ven que tienen veintitantas banderitas, cada cual más orgullosa de su soberanía. ¡Qué tontería! Dividir es debilitar. Las potencias son los protectores que prueban sus armas en nuestras guerrillas, que sean rojos o rayados. A la hora del final no hay diferencia. Invitan a nuestros líderes. A vender su alma al diablo verde Vete bonitas siglas Para que se sientan un poco más importantes Y el inocente pueblo de Latinoamérica Llorará si muere Ronald Reagan o la reina Y el bien paso a paso la vida a Carolina Como si esa gente supiera del subdesarrollo Estamos en un hoyo, parece que en realidad Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de 
de Estados Unidos Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos yeah. Para que se sientan en familia Copiamos sus barrios y su estilo de vida We try to talk in the USA language Para que ahora nos crean incivilizados Cuando visitamos sus ciudades Nos fichan y tratan como delincuentes Rusos, ingleses, gringos, franceses Se ríen de nuestros novelescos directores Somos un pueblito tan simpático Que todos nos ayudan cuando se de conflicto armar pero toda esa cantidad de oro la podrían dar para encontrar la solución definitiva al hambre latinoamérica es grande debe aprender a decidir latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de estados unidos latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de estados unidos Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos. Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos. Yeah. Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos. Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos. Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos Latinoamérica es un pueblo al sur de Estados Unidos Cheers So, I know what you're asking Jova, what happened? Did the dictatorship end at some point? The answer is yes, sort of. It's a weird one. Um, so, technically, the dictatorship ended in 1990. Technically, and I'm going to get into the technically in a bit. But for now, let's focus on the fact that the dictatorship ended, yes, because of surmounting international pressure, not just um, pushed by uh, Chileans who were exiled abroad and, and lived abroad, um, and sympathetic uh, international actors, musicians, um, and organizations that stood in solidarity with the people against the dictatorship. And despite the support that Pinochet had from politicians such as Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, so nobody's surprised really, but Pinochet had, was under such pressure that uh, in the end he decided to hold a referendum on whether or not the dictatorship should continue. And that was held in 1988, democracy won, and Pinochet was committed to a transferal of power to a democratic government. This was good because, well, no more dictatorship, no more threats of police violence, theoretically, and people could be free again, people could, uh, who were exiled could come back to the country. Um, and that's actually what somebody um, that I want to talk to you about later did, um, called Anna Pijou. Her, I think, I believe her parents had been exiled and she was born in France and raised in France. Uh, but once the dictatorship ended, they came back and she stayed and finished growing up in Chile. Now, bear that name in mind because she's important later. Um, but the 90s were, well, completely changed the game for various reasons, not just because the dictatorship ended, yeah, that, that was a big factor, but also because of increasing globalization, uh, the fall of the Soviet bloc, so the end of the Cold, uh, of the Cold War. Instruments became much more affordable, uh, especially electronic instruments that were previously not available to anybody, uh, to just anybody. Um, and people began to make all sorts of different music. So Chilean music sort of expanded in so many different directions. And people were making pop, uh, rock of various different subgenres. People were making ska, cumbia, and other kind of traditional Latin um, genres <laughs> and, and styles. Um, but the really political ones at the time during the 90s and the 2000s uh, were reggae and hip-hop um, that finally had come to Chile. The biggest reggae band in Chile was and is Gondwana, 
they were all very political, overtly political, talking about um, the dictatorship and uh, relating the stories of the victims of the dictatorship and the brutality and the families of the victims and missing peoples, all this sort of stuff. And in hip hop, you had bands like Tiro de Gracia and Maquisa, who were just very political in everything they, they said, criticizing economic inequality that still persisted in post-dictatorship Chile. Now, eh, Maquisa was super important. Um, well, all of them were super important, but Maquisa is really important to this lesson right now because one of the members of Maquisa was Ana Tiju. After Makisa, she went on to have a very, very successful solo career. In fact, I would say she's the most famous and well-known and influential Chilean musician today. Um, she's, she's like the first lady of Chilean hip-hop and rap, and she is an extraordinarily politically active person. Um, all of her songs have to do with uh, political and social activism, feminism, uh, supporting of movements, denouncing police brutality and governmental repression. Um, she's, just, she's just great. I love her. She, and she was very important for my generation in particular. So if you have a chance, check her out. But this song that's playing right now is called Vengo. It's from her album that has the same name, Vengo. Um, and it's, I, I, there's so many different songs to choose from her, but, uh, from hers, but this song, or this album rather, is just so great because she mixes this R&B and hip hop that is, um, that is her staple with Andean music. Who else mixed Andean music? Pop quiz. It was Los Jaivas. I didn't even give you the chance to respond. It's fine. <laughs> But yeah, so you see how this mixture of different, especially Western music with indigenous and traditional folkloric music um, brings in new elements and it's traditionally, or it tends to be a very political mixture. So it's just keeping that legacy going. Um, Ana Tiju has always been, you know, very supportive of protests all around the world, in Latin America, in Chile. She supported the 2011 students' protest, where students were protesting for free uh, higher education, um, which is something you might want to think about because this country no longer has free higher education. And, and she's been supportive, uh, and she even has supported the um, uprising in Chile last year. Wait, uprising? If you haven't heard of this, it's important. See, I think it, I want to say it was the 18th. If it wasn't, it was the 16th. The point is, in October of 2019, at the time of recording this, it was last year, um, there was a protest against a 30 pesos hike uh, in price for the subway, the metro, the underground, um, in Santiago. Now, 30 pesos is a equivalent, roughly equivalent to 30p, which doesn't sound a lot. You say, oh, it's 30p, whatever, who cares, I'll pay it. But also bear in mind that the price of living in Chile is vastly different than it is here. It's much more expensive uh, here, so 30p doesn't really seem like a lot in Chile. It means the difference between being able to afford a meal or not. Um, so poor people depend on that public transport in order to um, in order to work, in order to go study, in order to do literally anything. Um, and they kind of had enough. They said, we're going to protest this. And a bunch of students, always the students, um, got together and organized this protest. Uh, and they protested by jumping the turnstiles, effectively evading the fare as an act of protest. Police, uh, the militarized police, got sent in and repressed the protest very violently. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back. The uprising had officially begun and Chileans had had enough. Uh, they fought back with the police, they rioted. Um, 
in, I think it was October or November of 2019, Chile had held the largest protest and manifestation in Chilean history, over a million people in the city center. Just imagine that, so many people um, coming together for one cause. I have several causes, but really the cause is to end this injustice and inequality. And so many people denounced these protests and this uprising, saying they were violent, they didn't know what they were doing, they was nonsensical, um, calling them ridiculous because it was just about 30 pesos and who cares about that? Of course, the richer people would say that because it didn't affect them. Um, but what we said was, it's not 30 pesos, it's 30 years. Because the fact of the matter is that the dictatorship had never actually ended. Like, the Pinochet was no longer in power, but the economic right wing had all the money and all the power still. In fact, they had more power than, when, than they had during the dictatorship. People were losing jobs because of the multinational corporations that were being born out of this new neoliberal economic policy in Chile that Pinochet had established. Um, we were living under the same constitution that Pinochet had written in 1980. So we were living under a fascist constitution. We still are, actually. The police had not been demilitarized. In fact, they had been giving more powers. Um, and more benefits, more privileges, and they were essentially uh, able to act with impunity. Um, just so many different issues, the privatization of pensions, the privatization of water, uh, the privatization of healthcare and education. Um, pe poor people could not afford to send their kids to decent universities, even if they were smart, even if they had a good test scores. Uh, because of the because the universities were so expensive, so the uprising was trying to address all of these things. At the center of these protests, of these riots, of these uprisings was music, because that's such an important part of our culture. It's a part, an important part of our protests. Um, if you've ever been to a protest in the UK, if you're English, you've been to a protest in the UK. Chances are that it's always been very nice, it's been very respectable, not always, you know, um, but it's a couple of hundred people with some placards, someone with a megaphone. That's not how they do it in Chile. In Chile, they come out with the bands, where they come out with trumpets, they come out with drums, they come out to sing music and dance. If not, they come out with rocks and bricks to throw at the cops because they're militarized. They have riot gear, they have guns. <laughs> and tear gas. It's completely different. And music is always at the center of our protests. And this time it was no different. Um, and I could talk about so many different things, but I'm just going to do full circle here uh, and play some videos for you. These were videos of the early days of the uprising in which I think hundreds, if not thousands of people gathered to play on their guitars the important songs of our history, of our political heritage, uh, which were first, El Baile de los Que Sobran. I've already played it for you before, it's Los Prisioneros. Um, but the message is still the same, the economic inequality, the educational injustice, it's still there. And it still resonates 30 years later. And here are these people singing this song as an act of protest. <laughs> And they also played uh, another song by Victor Jara called El Derecho de Vivir en Paz. I haven't played this song for you. Um, it's called The Right to Live in Peace, which is, I mean, that, that's a message in and of itself. Uh, he originally wrote it in solidarity and support of the Vietnamese people struggling in the Vietnam War against the United States. Um, but it's, it, it became an anthem of the uprising. We want the right to live in peace. And here's this video of them singing it. <laughs>
take from this is that there really, for us in Chile, there is no division between politics and music. They're the same thing. In art and everything, they're all connected. They've always been uh, one and the same because that's what our heritage is all about. These artists have influenced me and countless others and they will continue to influence uh, future generations to come. And all we can hope to do is live up to their legacy and do what we think is right. Um, sometimes it's difficult to do. For me, I find it a little bit difficult being so far away, especially at such, a, such an important time. Um, and there's not really too much I can do. I do what I can. Um, in fact, the protests were so successful that they had to promise us a referendum to vote on the new constitution. Uh, we just voted this past October and we won with an 80% margin. We're getting a new constitution. It's going to get entirely written by our elected delegates, not by our parliamentary members, which is revolutionary. I don't know if anybody else has ever done this before, but it could mean something completely new for the entire world. It's a possibility. I, I did my part, I went and voted for it. Um, it is a bit difficult being so far away though, but I have tried to show my solidarity and support where I could. But I just wanted to share this part of my heritage, my culture and my history with you. Um, thank you so much for having a chat with me. I hope it wasn't too heavy, if it was, well, I mean, it, it is a heavy subject, but hey, I hope you're cozy. Get another brew if you need to. Um, mine's cold, but it doesn't matter. And I'm just gonna play one last song for you. This is one of my songs. It's not to, you know, plug myself or anything. Um, but it's just because I wanted to show you how this music has influenced me in my songwriting and in my journey as an artist. I wrote this song last year for the uprising, just in solidarity. And it's not like, it didn't blow up. It's not like a song that everybody knows. It doesn't need to be though, because all it needs to be is a song that I wrote in solidarity with my people. It's called Blood on, Blood on Our Hands, Blood on Your Hands, Blood on Hands. Sangre en las manos. But thank you for listening. Cuánta gente debe de sufrir, cuántas indignadas tendrás que hacer combatir para que estés satisfecho. Cuántos vicios debo resistir, cuánta avaricia, gula y soberbia de ti, tendremos que aguantarnos. Y se alza el mar, y se secaron los pozos, esta se nos va a matar. Cuántas voces tendrán que alzar. Cuántas gratos y tus llantos llenarán la ciudad para que al fin escuches. Cuántas balas vas a disparar, cuántas vas a secuestrar y violar y torturar para que no quede nadie. Nunca tuvieron la paz. Prisioneros de tus jaulas económicas dijeron no más. El pueblo está gritando que aquí no paran de resistir. El pueblo está gritando que así no se puede más vivir. Y si tenemos cacerolas y las piedras que lanzamos contra tanques y balas, tendrán sangre en las manos. Y si no alzamos la voz, tendremos sangre en las manos. Cuánta mierda nos van a tirar, 
cuánta agua, medicina y hasta dignidad Que la gente está muriendo Cuánta mierda nos vas a tirar Cuántas mentiras para dividirnos y hacer callar Qué imbéciles no somos La tierra se quema el país está en llamas, incendio de desigualdad. El pueblo está gritando que aquí nos han querido extinguir. El pueblo está gritando que así no se puede más vivir. Y si tenemos cacerolas y las piedras que lanzamos contra tanques y balazos tendrán sangre en las manos. Y si no tengo otra cosa que esta voz y esta guitarra Usaré mi canto contra metralletas que disparan Y si te quedas mirando tendrás sangre en las manos El pobre encapuchado o el paco que dispara con licencia del Estado El fascista que legisla a favor del empresariado El pueblo está gritando que así no se puede más vivir El pueblo está gritando que aquí no paran de resistir y si tenemos cacerolas y las piedras que lanzamos contra tanques y balazos tendrán sangre en las manos. Y si no tengo otra cosa que esta voz y esta guitarra, usaré mi canto contra metralletas que disparan. Y si te quedas mirando tendrás sangre en las manos. Y si no alzamos la voz tendremos sangre en las manos. Y si te quedas callado tendrás sangre en las manos. Thank you very much. I hope you all have a lovely day. My name is Jova. You can find me on social media as Jova in the Wave. Please support School of Integration and all the great work that they're doing here. Thank you so much.